As you know, this program will cover house rules, what board members of both co-ops and condos should know and should keep in mind on that very important topic. To my immediate left is Jay Taggart, Dorothy Finger, Diana Verrill, Ken Jacobs, and Jason Skishano. We will start with the board member component of our program. Diana Verrill and Jay Taggart will be our first two speakers. Batting in the leadoff spot, as they say in baseball, is Diana Verrill, who certainly is no stranger to anyone in our association. Diana has been chair of the CCAC since 2004. She's been a board member of the CCAC since the 90s, and she has served on various BRI and CCAC board committees. Diana is also president of Hastings House Tenants Corporation for the last 25 years. I wish we could verify if that's a record, because I believe it's got to be some kind of a record that someone as dedicated as Diana would serve for 25 consecutive years as a board president. That is really, really an amazing record. I guess you could call it the Cal Ripken of board presidents in terms of the CCAC. That's right. That's right. With that being said, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our chair, Diana Farrell. Thank you so much. Actually, I use a catalog, and that works very well. <laughs> As if you have a swimming pool, God help you. That's all I can say. But other things change too. Uh, propane grills. People want to cook out a lot more than they ever used to. Used to be they were happy to use a hibachi. Now they don't know the word. So bikes and carriages. People come from far away or New York City and they're used to parking their carriage or their children's bicycle in the public hallways. That doesn't work out here in Westchester. The fire codes are very strict about keeping bicycles, carriages, all of the public hallways free from any kind of clutter, which also includes running shoes, rubber boots, anything that anybody could trip over in an emergency rushing out of a building. Sports equipment outside and, and toys. A lot of children leave their toys, their bicycles, and well-meaning parents say they will go out and get them after they put the children to bed and then they forget. And if somebody trips, you're in for, right Jason? A whopping lawsuit. So that's something else that needs to be in your house rules. And then everybody's favorite, pets. The number of pets, if any, if you allow any at all. Whether cats can be indoor or outdoor cats. If you have carpeting in your public hallways, you really don't want cats going outside and scratching. And it's awfully important to create a pet committee. That saves your board from having to deal with all these little nitty gritty things. Have a notice sent around with the names of the people who have volunteered, hopefully, to serve on the pet committee. And they can deal with the problems. People know who to call if they have a problem with a neighbor's pet and then the board, they can come to your board for advice and legal advice as to which way they can go if there are problems. It's important to have in your house rules maintenance, whether it's the first of the month, the 15th of the month, at least then people know when it should be. And late fees, it's good to list those too. Not the fees, but when they're, <laughs> that they will be included in the maintenance bill. One of the things I think works very well when you do an interview of a prospective shareholder is to have them sign an acknowledgement paper, just a simple statement, I have read the house rules and I agree to abide by them. And then they, they sign it and date it. And that way when, as time goes on, and has happened to us many times, people say, I never got the house rules. Nobody put it under my door. I didn't know about that. We can pull that paper out and say, but when we interviewed you, you said you had read the house rules and you agreed to abide by them. And it has saved us on many, many occasions. So that's just an overview. And now I'm going to pass on to Jay Taggart, who will give you 
a little, another presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Diana. Jay Tagger, another member of our CCAC board, is our next speaker. Jay, as I said, is a member of the CCAC board. He has served in that role very well for the past two years. He is president of Franklin Plains Corporation. He has been board president of that facility for the past 13 years. He oversees a seven member board. The property is a few blocks from the Westchester Mall in White Plains. It is an 80 unit facility. We are very happy to have Jay Taggart make his first presentation to the CCAC membership. Please welcome Jay. I'm very glad to do this because this past year my board and I did exactly this. We revisited, revised, edited, and republished our house rules. It was a tremendous amount of work and a little bit complicated, but there are a few things I want to, uh, a few points I want to make that I think are very important. The first one is when you uh, decide to do this, you need to establish a purpose or a point of view. You just don't want to sit down and start listing arbitrary rules and everyone has a different idea. You want to decide what it is you're trying to accomplish. And some things that you probably want to accomplish are improving the safety and security of your property. Uh, you want rules that will benefit residents, rules that will enhance and improve living at your property. So you want to have a mindset and you're all in agreement or in accord as to what it is you're trying to achieve by editing and republishing your house rules. Number two, you want to approach it from a positive perspective if at all possible and sometimes that may not be possible but you don't want a list of you can't, you can't, do not, do not. You want to uh, present the rules in a way that uh, are logical and residents will understand that they are for their own good, for the betterment of the property, and it will improve the, uh, the general living uh, at that building. Um, an example would be, instead of saying, do not leave personal property in the hallway outside of your storage locker, <clears throat> you might say, uh, personal property needs to be contained within the confines of a storage locker. So just be aware of that. Uh, there are ways of expressing rules that don't sound uh, negative or restrictive. And number three, you want to streamline and simplify your rules. And when I did this, we found that we had the same information in two or three places, and that's so unnecessary. So you want to edit it down you don't want too much language, and in some instances, I just deleted things that I thought were obsolete or unnecessary or confusing. So, uh, just to review, number one, establish a point of view or a purpose for your house rules. Number two, approach it from a positive perspective when at all possible. And number three, streamline and simplify so it's not confusing or laborious for uh, hapless shareholders who have to plow through it and try to understand it. Uh, and that's, um, that's basically what we did. It is a lot of work, uh, but your board uh, should be very willing to uh, help you accomplish that. And it is important to have them updated and published uh, for your residents. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Diana. A job well done in terms of the component portion of our program as it relates to board members. We will now switch gears toward the legal component of our program. Our next speaker is Dorothy Finger. She is a principal of Finger and Finger. 
a professional corporation which is based in White Plains. Finger and Finger, as you know, is chief counsel to our cooperative and condominium advisory council, as well as to its parent organization, the Building and Realty Institute. She has spoken at several CCAC meetings in the past, as well as has addressed several key issues to committees of the CCAC. She is also a contributor to Council's Corner, which is the column that Finger and Finger prepares for our bi-monthly publication, Impact Newspaper. Dorothy will address house rules and how they apply to cooperatives and how those apply to cooperative boards as well as shareholders. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dorothy Finger. Good evening, everybody. Um, people who know me know two things. I'm very interactive, it's no secret, and I'm also a little lazy, so you guys have to do some of the work. That's why I gave the handout, and um, so you'll see there are questions. I'm not really just going to answer the questions from a legal perspective. I'm going to try to get a little bit of involvement so that you think about the questions. I think, you know, the, the board members here who've spoken about um, rules have answered the first question generally about why rules, the purpose, the need, and so forth. Just to um, back up a little bit, give you a little perspective, you know, uh, you all have in a co-op a plan, right? Everybody got a plan when they bought their co-ops? Anybody who didn't get a plan when they bought their co-op? No, everybody got a plan. And buried in that plan is the proprietary, a copy of the form of the proprietary lease. You each got your own. And then there's also attached to that the house rules. Now I'm going to tell you a secret about the house rules. The house rules are similar to the date of the annual meeting. They're almost all the same in the original plan that you have. And the reason that they're all the same is that I'm not the only lazy lawyer. The lazy lawyers who started out in the early 80s and started, that was the big time, late 70s, early 80s, was when the big conversions came. They didn't sit down and each one write a plan from scratch. They copied somebody else's. So most of the annual meetings are in June, right? I, I, how many in June? Eh, not so many, I guess they changed, or October. June and October, right? May. May, okay, May or June, because somebody put that in one of the plans and everybody copied it. And it's the same thing with the rules. If you look at the rules from one plan to another, you know, don't hold me to it. They're not all exact, but pretty much that's how they were. They copied them. Now, the rules were put in there partly because you should have rules and partly because the people who were converted the buildings wanted to have rules because they were sponsors and owners and they wanted the property kept a certain way because many of them still held units that they wanted to sell. So they wanted to make sure things were ship shape. Okay? So that's the other reason that we have rules in the original plans. So the question is why not have rules? You know, why why don't we just not have any rules? And I think if you live in a co-op, it's like any community, you know, it's not a co-op is a community. It's just like a village or a town. It's people living together, and they have rules. Because if we don't have rules, we have anarchy. And in a smaller segment, as you narrow it down from state to town to village to co-op, it gets smaller and smaller, and the anarchy can be even greater in proportion. So you have to have some, some rules. How many people got copies of the rules when they moved into their co-ops. Okay, you gotta get some work here, okay. That's good, you got copies, okay. And did you look at them before you moved in? How many looked? Uh, somebody's fudging it, I don't believe everybody. Okay. More than I thought, but I still, right, people are, you didn't really look, okay. And how many looked at the rules after they moved in, but before they became a board member? How many looked at the rules after you moved in, but before you became a board member? See, it's getting less and less. And how many looked at the rules before you became a board member because you had a problem with a neighbor? 
Okay, that's a couple of them. And how many because you wanted to know if you could do something? Okay, and a couple. So that's the problem. The use of the rules once you're in, you know, now you're, you're in, it's like a fraternity, you're in. Now you don't have to look at them anymore, right? It goes in the, in the drawer with the copy of the stock that you can't find later on when you need it, but it's there, okay? And how many uh, first looked at the rules seriously when they became board members? Okay, and what was the reason because somebody said we have to revise them, or was the reason because somebody was complaining about somebody and you wanted to figure out what to do? Revising. Revising? How many revising when they, okay. Fair. And how many because there was a problem? Yeah. You have good, good shareholders, no problems. Okay, so that's when people uh, on the board look at them. So, um, how many, somebody, uh, Diana mentioned handing them out at the time that people are interviewed. How many do that at the time they're interviewed, that they interview people? Not so many. Now that's an interesting idea. Uh, it's important for people to know that there are going to be rules, that they're not just whoever they think they are when they buy. We, we give an abridged version of it. Okay. The, so it's not the exact house rules, but right. just a bulleted, Okay, so you let them know that there's something. Correct. I would suggest also, because I had that experience in uh, one co-op, is that somebody said they were given the house rules, so that meant they were accepted. <laughs> okay, now people are laughing because it's those in the know know that that's a pretty big leap of faith. But you, if you do it, I would suggest that you also indicate on the copy that this is somehow just for information purposes only sort of thing because you don't want to give people the impression that now you got the rules you're in like Flynn. Yeah? Uh, we, do, we provide the house rules uh, during the application process. Okay, but similarly, similarly, yeah, you could do it then. It's good to have it before. The other thing that can be done which uh, is I think good is if you have it in the um, forms that you give to the transfer agent and they sign them at the closing. That's yet another reminder and they take a copy with them and you know it reinforces the concept if not the specific rules. So that's kind of just procedural stuff that, that uh, how you do it. So now what happens? Now they're in and now there are rules and the biggest question, I guess, that we, um, that we get as attorneys is enforcement, right? That's the issue. You got the rule, but what do you do when somebody is not following the rule? So what are the alternatives? Anybody have ideas? What do you do when you're a co-op? Somebody doesn't follow the rule. What's the first thing you do? Send a letter. Send a letter. Send a letter. And who sends the letter? Management. Management. Okay. So they get a letter, and the letter says you, there's noise and you haven't uh, done the 90% carpeting or whatever, please uh, correct this, right? So then what happens? Inspection or notice to the door? Well, okay, there are a lot of steps, but suppose they don't do anything. They're, not, they're just ignoring you. So then what do you want to do? Okay, so let's talk about fines. That's the normal response. And fines are a whole chapter. Illegal. Well, let's let's be, well let's no, let let it, it, let's, 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 let's <laughs> let me handle that one. But fines are a big problem in a lot of ways. First of all, you have so many different kinds of breaches of the rules, right? There's the no carpeting. There's uh, leaving things in the hall. There's no smoking in the hallways. There's the pets, which is a whole other thing. Um, there, there are so many rules. And then how much is the fine for each one? Now, when the fine is $25, so maybe they pay it, maybe they don't. And then what do you do? You're not going to bring a proceeding as part of the rent because then it's a big deal and you don't want to bother them that much and you say, well, okay, maybe when they close, 
Meanwhile, the behavior is still going on. So then do you levy another fine? So fines can help in certain situations. You have to know your customers. You have to have sort of some responsible structure to the fines. But a lot of times, fines either just go unpaid and the behavior is ignored, or if you get to court, there are some judges that don't grant that as part of the relief. So it is a very complicated issue when it comes to fines. And then, of course, there's not, not always, let me ask you this, it's an interesting question. Is there unanimity on the board about whether and how much to fine? How many people find that on their board everybody kind of agrees? Yeah, and a lot of people, there's disagreement as either to the amount or whether in a particular instance, is that fair to say, is that what's happening? So that alone creates some feelings on the board. It's a, it's a different approach. So fines are a way, but I don't know if they're the best way, but it also depends on the kind of rule that you are um, dealing with. So, you know, it, it's... When you seek to enforce fines, as I'm indicating, it's problematic. So I say, well, I'm telling you, so don't fine. Now I'm going to tell you a joke. Um, it's an old joke. It's a riddle. Somebody says, what is it that hangs on the wall, it's blue, and you wipe your hands on it? Anybody have an idea? No. Okay. It's a herring. So it's not blue. So it doesn't hang on the wall. So you don't wipe your hands on it. It's, you know, it's irrelevant. So the fines become irrelevant in a lot of cases. What is the alternative? And the alternative is in a co-op, um, you can bring an action based on a breach of the lease. Because you have a lease. There's a landlord-tenant relationship in a co-op. People don't often understand that because many times their attorneys don't explain that to them when they buy the co-op. But it is a landlord and a tenant. So you can bring a proceeding for a breach of the lease. And what do you have to do to do that? Well, the first thing is that you do have to procedurally serve a notice to cure. But how do you have the right to terminate somebody if you've served the notice to cure and not have to actually litigate the underlying issue in the courts. That has come about through a long series of cases. There's a legal uh, precedent, a legal uh, statement about uh, the, the business judgment rule of the board. And a long line of cases developed and said that if a board decides, based on its investigation and its determination, that somebody has violated the rule, then you can go to court and you don't have to litigate or have testimony about the actual underlying breach, actually what happened. The fact that the board decided it is sufficient. Now that may sound simple now, but that flies in the face of a lot of what is normal in a, in, a, in a case that comes before a court. You usually have to prove what happened. And this came about because there were cases that applied that business judgment rule in normal corporations to cooperatives, but they applied it first where the shareholders voted on it. And that's a little iffy. Because, you know, you've got to have a meeting and have everybody there and you have to have a majority and then they've got to vote on it and it's their neighbor and maybe they're popular or maybe they're not popular and they're going to be punished not because of the breach but because somebody doesn't like them or maybe they can get enough people to come and, and then it may be that it's a noise issue so then you have the person who's being affected getting up and talking about what a hardship it is living next to them. But... You know, you really don't want to do that. Uh, it's, it's not a comfortable situation, so it's much better. And finally, we had some cases, particularly London Terrace, which was handed out. And I'm going to be right up front and tell you that we like London Terrace because it allows boards to make that decision. And we like London Terrace because the judge gave credit to Kenneth Finger in his decision. So we really love London Terrace. 
And London Terrace stands for that proposition that the board can do it. But the question is, can the board just do it? And that is, is not so. London Terrace is an interesting case because the behavior was so egregious. You should read it. I'm not even going to tell you because it's like a novel. You won't believe it till you see it, until you read it. But the kinds of things that this person was doing over and over, and had gotten letters over and over, were really way out there. So in a way, it's not a good case because it's the extreme of behavior, but it, it led to a foundation and guidelines for what boards can and, and should do in a lot of instances. But to do it, you have to follow the concept of what uh, London Terrace tells you. London Terrace tells you that the board has to send letters. And then they have to, or should, um, have a notice that there's going to be a hearing before the board, and the board will take quote-unquote testimony from the person, allow them to have an attorney, allow them to state their case before the board and investigate the facts, and after that, the board will make a determination as to whether or not there has been a breach of the rules, and if there is that breach, then they will send an, another notice that says that uh, the board reviewed it and they find the breach, if it's not cured within a certain period of time, and so forth, that they will serve a notice of termination and terminate the lease. So it's, a, it's not a simple process, but I think it's a healthy process. It gives the shareholder an opportunity to explain, state their case, to cure it, to bring evidence, if they have it, to convince the board that the complaints that have been filed are, are not true or circumstantial or however they want to phrase it. It gives them that opportunity and it can work. So there are a lot of guidelines that, you know, if you ask the attorney that, that go with that, but I think it's a good, a good methodology um, in those cases. So that's the, the guts, I think, of what goes on with rules. When it comes to amending the rules, I think it is helpful and healthy to do so periodically. Um, the, there are some rules that cannot be uh, promulgated by the board. Uh, for example, this is one that's now being talked about a lot. Can you have a no smoking rule within the person's unit? And you can, but that type of rule really needs to be voted on by all of the shareholders. Because that's in their apartment, and unless the lease, unless that particular proprietary lease has something that it would allow you to go there, it would be not a good idea unless you had all of the shareholders. Outside the apartment, in the hallways, that's a different story. That has a different element to it. So those are the kinds of things that we um, live with and weigh and talk about every time we get a phone call and discuss and try to come up with solutions for the board. Any questions? Yes, yeah, sure. If somebody wants to bring. Speak <laughs> back after you. <laughs> Thank you. I was curious to see what you suggested. If one wanted to bring a certain house rule to a bylaw, make it a bylaw, I know it needs to be voted on by two thirds of the shareholders, so on and so forth. But um, how, how would one go about that as a board? If it was something that was very serious and very well, important to the board, where, of course, once the board changes, a house rule can change at any point in time based on the change of the board. So, so can, how to make so it a bylaw? So, so can a bylaw. So can a bylaw. A bylaw could be changed by the board. Of course it can, but it's much harder to change a bylaw versus a house rule. House rule can be just... Mm -hmm. You know. it's, it's the, a little bit debatable about which is harder, but the question is what kind of rule would you want to change so that it's a bylaw? <laughs> what, what is the point of making it a bylaw? That's the question. I mean, don't th just do something to do it. You know, the rules have a way of being enforced, as I said, either with a fine or in a, in a, a much more, uh, much stronger legal way. 
and what would you gain by making it a bylaw? Bylaws, in general, it's a, like the Constitution. They give a framework, mostly, for what the directors can do, what the, you know, those kinds of terms, voting, uh, those kinds of shareholder rights, but they're not the day-to-day. -day. The proprietary lease, see that's where I was going with the smoking thing. The proprietary lease is kind of a midway document. The proprietary lease speaks to the relationship between the unit owner and the cooperative. So it has some substance there that relates to, it talks about subletting, it talks about what you can do, what you can't do, it talks about what happens when you sell, what you have to provide, and who, to whom you can sell, what, what, um, what the board's rights are in approving and so forth. So it's kind of a midway, it, it, it delineates what the rights are of the shareholder and what the rights of the cooperative are, which is why in a smoking situation, if you're talking about the individual apartment, that would be in that agreement, more in that agreement. Beyond that, you know, if it's just the question of the carpeting or, uh, you know, that kind of thing, why would you, you would need well, that? Well, for instance, some buildings are adamant about not wanting pets. But, and and the well, then majority of the shareholders don't want that, and yet it's only in the house rules. Well, that's okay. The house rules are fine and, for that. The it wouldn't make shareholders are very concerned that it's only in the house rules and not a but that But the question is whether it's a valid concern. It's good in the house rules. You have a means to enforce mm -hmm. the, the problem with the pets mm -hmm. in enforcement is the 90-day rule. Right. Uh, everybody know what the 90-day rule is? Yeah, everybody knows what the 90-day rule is. It's the 90-day the rule is from the day anybody in the building knows about that pet, if the if you don't act and bring the action within that 90 days, then they keep the pen. So that's, you know, it's, the, it's not so much whether it's in the house rules or the lease, it's again the enforcement. Yeah? You said anybody, I, I think it's, isn't it somebody in the party, like a board member or a super, well, it's not just anybody who knows. Well, no, well, no, it can be other residents. Let me interject. When you have, this is like, right. Um, for those of us who are uh, relegated to the back here, if you have a question, please stand up, uh, identify yourself, you call for comment, whatever, ask the question, because then we have a good chance of hearing in the back. And if not, then the speaker can always repeat the question. And I'll bring the mic over. Uh, the question, well, the question was simple. The question, uh, I mean, I say, I said, if anybody has seen the dog, and I do stand somewhat corrected, it should be the super or somebody on the board. No, correct, but, but question. well, well, yeah. I mean, it's you, it is more authoritative if it's a super or so on. But I would suggest that if the person comes in and says, you know, everybody in my line saw me walking that dog for three months, and they told the super, and you know, it was no secret. <laughs> It's gonna be it's gonna be a tough case anyway. It's 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 very difficult. The dog monitoring the dogs no, is a so tough. Some problem. people will hide the cat in the, in the apartment and go. You know, maybe yeah, but a neighbor knows. Well, I'm saying it depends. You have to show they have to show that somebody really knew. Right. But it's yeah, and you know the, the cases where they say that the super came in and should have known the dog was there because he came in six times and the dog was always there. But maybe he didn't know. But that's their level of proof. We, yeah. we, I'm sorry, we, we need to hold oh, further okay. questions. We have two more speakers. Oh, right. Then there will be an extensive question and answer period. Right. But and we I, do have two more speakers. So I, I yield to my colleague who's going to tell you the difference and uh, deal with condominiums. Thank you, Dorothy. Great job. Our next speaker is Ken Jacobs. And as Dorothy mentioned, Ken will review house rules. From the condo perspective, Ken is an attorney with Smith, Smith, Bus, and Jacobs, which is a well-known real estate co-op and condo law firm. Smith, Bus, and Jacobs works with many, many real estate industry associations throughout our area, including the Community Associations Institute. Ken's firm has been a member of the Building and Realty Institute since the 1990s. <laughs> Please help us welcome Ken Jacobs. Hi. First, um, how many people here live in a condo or like associate with condos? 
Okay. All right. Great. Okay. Wonderful. So, <laughs> um, I, I, my colleagues have ably presented examples of house rules, uh, and uh, what I'm going to try to do is is talk about the differences and the similarities, really, between house rules in condos and, and co-ops, particularly uh, taking particular emphasis uh, with the condo. So, first thing. I want to dispel a myth that probably you all have, or many people have, which is that if you buy a condo, you can do whatever you want. In reality, uh, the, the rules governing how you operate in a condo are very same on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, they're very similar to the rules that you have in a co-op. So the condo boards will pass rules about alterations and about pets and about uh, moving in and moving out and how much carpeting you can have, just like you have in a co-op. And uh, they're called rules and regulations frequently in condos rather than house rules. That's just semantics. The biggest difference between house rules in condos and house rules in co-ops is in enforcement. Uh, Dorothy went into how because you have a landlord-tenant relationship in a co-op, you can send a notice of default, you can start the clock ticking, you can take them to court, if only in a condo. Um, in a condo, the, all they have is court action. Uh, to be, it's, like, it's like a dispute between neighbors. There's no landlord-tenant relationship. You can't send a notice of default and say we're going to terminate your ownership interest in the unit the way you can with a co-op. Uh, you actually, if you actually go to legal action, what you have to do is you have to start an action in court as saying, I want an injunction to compel this person to remove their pet, to, uh, to, to get out of the unit if they're an illegal tenant, uh, to put carpeting on their, 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 their apartment. You can imagine how expensive this gets. And yes, in theory, just like in co-ops, uh, the court can, can make the offender pay the legal fees. But since you're actually starting a full court action instead of summary proceedings, the legal fees skyrocket. And the courts are frequently reluctant to make the offender for what might be a relatively minor offense, minor compared to giving up your apartment. Uh, so somebody's got to absorb that, and it's frequently the condo. So condo boards, when they're looking to enforce their regulations, they try to be, they, 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 they pay particular attention to what can we do besides court action. So some condo boards have required mandatory mediation. And mediation is not arbitration. Mediation is if you have a problem, you have to go to a committee, the committee might be a couple of board members, might be the managing agent, but you have to talk about the problem before you actually go to court action. It's, it's, alt, it's a form of alternative dispute resolution. That's worked sometimes. Uh, the, um, the fine option, as Dorothy pointed out, uh, fines sound great, but just like in co-ops, courts frequently won't enforce them. They, and they have a whole bunch of reasons why not, and this actually applies to co-ops too. They look to see whether you have an authorization in your documents. Now, a condo has a declaration and bylaws, and the bylaws in a condo are different from the bylaws in a, in a co-op. They're, they're actually more, uh, more material. Uh, and frequently, the board will have authority to impose fines, and it's right there under powers of the board, or it can be implied. And you have to check your proprietary lease carefully to see whether you have language like that in your proprietary lease, or you run the risk that when you get to court, uh, the court's going to throw it out, or the court just might be sympathetic. So the fine option can, can create some potential leverage. The fine may not be collected, but it could just sit there. And eventually, when the unit owner sells the apartment, he may have to, he may have to pay it. So, that's the biggest difference between condos and co-ops when it comes to the actual regulations being imposed. The, the other thing I just want to talk briefly touch on things that may be common to co-ops and condos, but uh, in condos that we have to think about 
what are the limits of the regulations? Uh, there are a lot of quality of life regulations, and absolutely you look at safety and, co and quality of life, but could you pass a regulation saying everybody with an air conditioner has to pay $50 a month? Well, that's not exactly quality of life regulation. That's a way of getting extra money, and a court may not say that's valid. What you have to do is you have to phrase it as a quality of life, uh, uh, quality of life issue. So, for example, homeowner's insurance, okay? We, we universally uh, propose that people carry homeowner's insurance whether they're in a co-op or a condo. And the question is, can we pass that by regulation? Can we pass that by a house rule? Uh, if we call that a quality of life regulation, I think it's over, more than 50% that we could say in order to preserve the quality of life of the shareholders or the unit owners in the building, we are requiring that all shareholders or unit owners carry homeowners insurance. It has the incidental effect of costing money, but so does putting down carpeting. If you have to spend $1,000 for carpeting, that has the incident, in order to, in order to comply with the house rule that says you have to put carpeting on your floor, we say getting homeowners insurance is an incident, paying for it is an incidental effect of preserving quality of life. All right, so the, uh, the final issue, I want to I want to repeat something the other uh, panel members have said, which is check your current check your current regulations to make sure they're up to date. Okay, a lot of associations are still using the regulations that were passed by the sponsor. How many of your proprietary leases, and you look in the house rules, talk about velocipedes? I'll bet I'll bet that half yours do. The anyway, check them. Okay, and you're gonna you're gonna want to. You don't have to include every agreement in your house rules. You can say in the customary form used by the condo or the co-op. Uh, but for uh, existing condos and co-ops, you're gonna find after a while you have a lot of house rules. I mean, you you have guidelines for alterations and move-ins and move-outs and leasing and pets and insurance and laundry and the pool, and fitness, or, and it can add up to a pretty thick bunch. So you might consider. Uh, like two, essentially two sets of house rules. The short version, which says in the condo's customary form, okay, and then you refer it out to a longer version, create a handbook for incoming shareholders or incoming unit owners. And that has all the current rules. And make sure, though, you warn people, we can change this at any time. Okay, and don't forget to circulate them. There's nothing worse than trying to enforce the unwritten policy. Oh yes, the board discussed that two years ago. We had it in our minutes, but nobody ever knew about it. So, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I thank you, Ken. I had a baseball citation earlier, so I'll introduce our last speaker with a baseball citation. Our closer, our Mariano Rivera, for the program this evening is Jason Schichano who, like Mariano, deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> Jason is president of Levitt First Associates Limited, which is based in Yonkers. As you all know, Levitt First is the insurance manager for the Co-op and Condo Council, as well as our parent organization, the Building and Realty Institute. Jason sits on several BRI committees, and he contributes, along with his partner, Ken First, to Insurance Insights, which is an insurance column in our bi-monthly newspaper, Impact. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jason Skishaw. Well, um, I think we got started a little bit late, and, um, and I don't want to keep people, I certainly don't want to be to blame for getting you a bit late to bed. So, um, does everybody have the handouts that, that were on the tables? Because that's going to make this go a lot quicker. Um, I'm not going to cover all the details in this. I'm just going to hit the top lines, then we'll get to, uh, to questions and answers. I wanted to address assurance-related topics um, relative to house rules. And I'm going to caveat this by saying that everything on this paper, you should check with your attorney. Because you don't put things into house rules without checking with your attorney, or you're going to get bite off more than you can chew and have more problems than you bargain for. The first comment that I would make is that all of you that uh, have to deal with insurance for your condos or co-ops get these horrible things from insurance companies called recommendations from the insurance carriers. They deal with any number of things such as the insurance carrier came out and inspected and they saw gas grills on the decks or the patios 
or they saw the use of heating, uh, temporary heating devices, uh, portable heating devices. There was personal stuff, as was alluded to earlier, bikes or shoes in, in the common areas and in the, in the passageways that are creating a fire. All of those things, right? Those are recommendations from the insurance care. Are they really recommendations? What are they, Mike? They're required. They're required. They should call them requirements because if you don't do them, eventually, if you don't do them, your insurance will be non-renewed or canceled and you'll have to replace it at a higher cost with less coverage. So the first thing that I would say is think about the common types of recommendations you get from insurance carriers and to the extent possible, to the extent reasonable, if they're not already there, include some house rules that might address those recommendations before they come up. And I've listed a number of them there on the handout. The second is, is pretty obvious. Um, you know, I'm talking about insurance. Everybody, who here has had insurance premiums for your condo and co-op that has gone down in the last two years? Raise your hand. <laughs> the only question that's been asked tonight where not one person in this entire room of people has, 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 has raised their hand. So nobody's insurance has gone down. Everybody's insurance has gone up, right? And in and, and, and most condos and co-ops, insurance has gone up without any claims, right? Most of your insurance premiums have gone up and none of you have had claims and you're saying, well, how could this possibly be? There are condos and co-ops out there that have had claims, some that have had bad claims, whose insurance in the last couple of years has doubled or tripled. I kid you not. So the next thing that you can do to help yourselves out is put things in your house rules, again, to the extent reasonable and possible, that can help reduce your liability for claims. Certain things like requiring that if you're going to do uh, updates or renovations to your unit, that you be required, that the board requires that um, the contractor be approved, that certain documentation such as insurance certificates and indemnification agreements, etc., be required before the work can start, that type of thing. Uh, I've gotten a number of calls in the last couple of years about use, using social halls or common rooms for private parties, for sweet 16 parties or, or, or um, uh, baby showers, that type of thing. Can you do it? Sure you can. Is there risk? Yes, there is. What about if they're serving alcohol? It's even more risk. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you clamp down and you say you can never use this great social hall that we have. But there are ways to mitigate that risk and I presume you can include in your house rules a requirement that, that you adhere to board regulations with respect to the use of that type of room. And one of those requirements might be that if you're going to use the room, you get what's called an event insurance policy. And that insurance policy can protect the, the building, the condo or the co-op, as well as the person renting the room and the board and everyone else that needs to be named additional insured. You can put a a liquor liability rider on that thing. You can buy it on the internet, this policy, and it costs about you know, $100, $150. So that's an interesting way, possibly something that you can incorporate into your rules that can uh, eliminate or, or help mitigate risk. And then other simpler things like the use of, of your pool or your gym and when it can be used and who can use it and how old do they have to be, those types of things. The third thing, and it's a touchy subject, and you know I've I've heard different things, and the the attorneys on the panel have have have, have alluded to the requirement or to making a requirement in the house rules with respect to carrying of unit owner or shareholder insurance. Obviously, every know, everybody knows the importance of this. It becomes incredibly important when your building burns down, and when you find out that there are four or five shareholders, or unit owners that don't have insurance, and when they're Buildings being rebuilt for the next year, they don't have a place to live and there's no insurance to play, pay for their loss of use and temporary living expenses and, and they don't have any contents covered, so they lost everything. That's a bad story to hear and try to address. And it, it's really, it, it's tough because you have sympathy at the same time, you know, you, it's tough to make an exception. So you should address the issue of, of insurance requirements for the unit owner or the shareholder to the extent possible within your bylaw or within your um, um, your house rules or if you can't do it there you should at least you know sort of as an aside do it somehow make it known put it out there so that nobody can say well I didn't know that I needed insurance for my own unit okay um, critically important to somehow some way address that the last thing that I can say is that how many of you here who are, are board members 
have had to address in one way, shape, or form a conflict with a shareholder or a unit owner on a house rule? Raise your hand. Wow. Several, maybe about half in the room, okay? So we have a lot of those. How, any of them that have resulted in, in legal action? A few, okay, a few, uh, more, more than a couple. So hopefully when you get a, uh, a situation that arises to legal action where a unit owner or a shareholder brings an action against the board uh, claiming that a house rule is not appropriate or out of line or, or, or not legal or what have you, um, your insurance, your director's and officer's insurance is going to kick in and, and address that lawsuit against the board and against the association or the corporation. A couple of things that you should be sure of. Number one, ask your insurance broker, does my DNO policy cover non-monetary claims? Because the types of things that we're talking about here, can I have a pet parakeet, can I leave my bike in the hall, don't have to do with suing for money. There, there, there's not a monetary relief involved. Okay, it's a non-monetary situation. And in and, and some directors and officers policies, the good ones, probably the ones that most of you have, have non-monetary relief addressed. And you want your insurance, your DNO insurance to address that type of a claim. But if you don't if it excludes non-monetary relief, it only addresses claims where somebody's asking for money, you got a problem. And then the other thing is make sure and ask your broker, does my directors and officers policy cover my managing agent as well? because the managing agent often has an integral part in, in addressing these issues. They've been involved in discussions and sure enough, the unit owner and shareholder, if they're gonna sue the board, they're gonna sue the managing agent as well. Most good policies, which most of you, your associations and corporations have, address the managing agent, but there are a lot of them out there that don't. So just ask the question, make sure it's there, have your broker check, and, and you'll be you'll be you'll be um, a, you'll be covered, and your your property manager will be covered if and when that comes up. But I will caution you. Final note of caution. I've heard board members say, "Well, let them sue us, and our insurance will pay for it." <laughs> so, hopefully, your insurance will address your 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 legal costs. The thing about it is, there are very few insurance companies that are insuring directors and officers at this point. There, I can count them on less than one hand, the good ones. So if you have a claim, one claim, against your DNO policy, your premium is going up. I promise you that. I started off by saying your premiums are going up without claims. So if you have a DNO claim and your premiums go up, you're not going to be happy. If your, your, your DNO carrier non-renews you, your premiums could go up substantially. They could quadruple, I kid you not, if you have a couple of claims. So you need to really think about the prudence of you know, saying, oh, let them sue us versus trying to work something out, trying to mediate and, and, and avoiding legal action and avoiding having your insurance kick in. Thanks very much. Uh, Mike McCoy from Brampton Management. I have a question, uh, Dorothy and Ken, about the smoking issue because I'm being asked by most of my boards uh, about that. It's a hot topic. And it's a two-part question, one dealing with in the apartments and one in the common areas. Uh, in the apartments, um, I know you can't really at this point limit you know, people from smoking, but can you uh, address the issue through the house rules and specifically creation of uh, uh, noxious odors uh, permeating the halls and, and adjacent apartments? Can you give me the second part. Oh, I uh, thought that was a two. No, no, that's that's the first part. I, the second I part, it, as far as common areas, I know you can uh, restrict smoking in the common areas, right. which many times include the steps outside and any common uh, right. exterior common area. But what I'm being asked is, can you actually, uh, as many corporations do, make a rule that say you can't smoke within so many feet of the building? Okay, uh, I'll answer that one first. I think if it's on co-op property, you can. I don't know that you can do it if it's on public property. So that one's a little, I, my view, a little simple. I haven't seen, most of the places that I've been involved with, it's, it's their property. So um, the first one that has to do with, in a co-op with, uh, 
within the apartment, okay, within the apartment, uh, you would have to amend the proprietary lease unless there's something very specific in the lease which I would find hard to believe, uh, you know, uh, just because of when they were drafted and what people were thinking at the time. So you would have to amend the proprietary lease, which would require the vote of the shareholders, which can be done. And I have a building now that's in the process of trying to do that. Um, with regard to the common areas and the noxious odors, that's, that's a valid um, approach, and it can be used. It's difficult to prove. That's, that's a little more difficult to prove. Um, if you went through the process that I spoke about before, it might be possible if you had witnesses and dates and times and you brought the person to a meeting and they didn't say, well, I don't smoke, so it's somebody else, and then you have, you know, you have to really be able to identify it and, and nail it down, but it's, it's possible, and it, that's why that's in there. I think, I don't think it was to address smoking. Uh, it was probably the cooking odors from years ago, but again, it's the same kind of thing. And there are actually, you know, there now there's a whole, it's a whole in industry of experts in all kinds of things. So now there are experts who can go in and test apartments and tell you that yes, there's a huge amount of smoke and it's going into the closets and it's going into the electrical outlets and because it's in apartment 4E, it can uh, go through the outlet to 4F um, and they measure it and you know, so there are technical elements to it now where it's possible. But it second is. Second hand smoke is a big issue. Yes, it's the second hand smoke. The question that I'm right. getting is, you know, does it constitute second hand smoke? Is there anything that they can do? Well, I think, I think second hand smoke does yeah, qualify. Yeah, 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 yes, yes, yes. I agree that uh, you should amend your documents, get the, the unit owners or the shareholders behind you to, to amend the documents rather than having the board pass a regulation because the court's going to do a balancing act and they're going to say, the rights of the unit owner or the shareholder. They outweigh the, dis the discretion. The board is arbitrary or capricious in deciding they're, that they're going to regulate activity within the unit. But if the unit owners or the shareholders amend the proprietary lease, the court's going to say, you made a contract. When you bought a co-op or a condo unit, you made a contract that you were going to abide by the rules of the community of your fellow owners. And if your fellow owners pass a bylaw that says, you can't smoke within your unit. It doesn't matter that you're a heavy smoker. It doesn't matter that you're, you claim you're addicted. It doesn't matter you bought your unit and the rule didn't exist. You're stuck with it. And in fact, a building we represent in Westchester passed a condo bylaw, amended its condo bylaws to prohibit smoking within individual units, and we just litigated that and we obtained a restraining order. And the court basically told the owner, you're going to have to stop smoking or move. And so uh, it it can be it can be enforced. When you say a vote, do you say a vote should be a supermajority or just fifty one to fifty? In order to amend your bylaws, okay, or your proprietary lease, you you generally need at least two thirds. Okay. Okay. It, you have to look at the document, and that'll tell you. No. But that that's what you do. You have and it, you you have right. a notice of meeting. You go through. Fifty one to fifty. No, not fifty one to fifty. It wouldn't. Yeah, I mean just. No, he can't say he's grandfathered. You can you can grandfather him. You can say, as this bylaw did, for a period of six months after passing this bylaw, you're allowed to smoke on your terrace. Okay? You can do that, but if you don't, it is still enforceable. There is a building in New York that passed a no smoking bylaw, a condo. Uh, same thing. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's enforceable. It didn't have a grandfather clause. This is something where people decided it's a risk. It's like buying insurance, right? You, pass, you, you amend your bylaws and say you have to carry homeowner's insurance. You can't say, I didn't do it. If I haven't done it for 10 years, I can, I'm not going to do it now. I'm grandfathered. We have time for three more questions. I'm going to start with Mary right here. And then we'll go to Ms. Lavard and then Hill. Mary Milan, Bronxville Garden Co-op Apartments. Uh, my question is to Jason about the insurance. 
Um, I realize how important it is for every shareholder to have their stick of insurance, but typically the management agents and the co-op only requires once a year to them to be submitted. So if that's in May and mine expires 10 days later, there's literally a whole slew of people who could go a full year and not have coverage and no one would ever know. Um, and the other side of that is also when shareholders are asked and they don't comply, what is typically the next step to follow up? Okay, so the two-part question, and I'll, I'll address the first part, and your, I'll just start with the second part. Your attorney should address the second part. What do you do? That's the legal question, and, and what you can get away with and fines and, and other types of penalties is out of my purview, but it's something you should discuss with your attorney. As far as when you request verification as to whether or not the unit owner and shareholder has insurance relative to when each and every residence insurance expires, that's the whole point of trying to make it mandatory or required that they have the insurance so that because it, the insurance is liability which potentially protects the building from, from negligence of the resident and it's then it's property insurance for the resident themselves. If the building burns down the day after you check and they don't and the resident doesn't have insurance, their their contents isn't going to be covered. Their loss of use and temporary uh, living expenses aren't going to be covered. No skin off your back, you told them it was a requirement. They didn't have it, no big deal to you. Where your concern as a board member is if they started the fire because they were smoking in bed and they burnt your building down, whether or not they have insurance that you can go back at or subrogate the claim to. Most associations have Bilateral waivers of subrogation, true? Many. Many. So if someone's smoking in bed and they burn the building down, if there's a waiver of subrogation, you can't go after the resident anyway. If there is no bilateral the waiver. Company can't well, <laughs> but the insurance company or the association couldn't either, right? It depends on what it says. Okay, <laughs> it, there's a lot of depends. Yeah. But as far as that potential gap, it, it, it's a risk and something that I don't know how you could reasonably address. Next we have uh, CCAC board member okay. Michelle LaVar. Can I, can I, can I add something to that answer, Jeff? I just want, when, when, the, when they say they have proof of insurance, it usually has, I'm just thinking out loud, but it seems to me that when somebody answers the managing agent's questionnaire about do you have insurance, it has the insurance and it has the dates. So if it's going to expire, they should be notified that they're not in compliance, that they, you know, that, that they should be renewing it and proof of the renewal. It's an administrative nightmare to do that to a tenant. It is, but, but most of them are not going to be, if, you know, that close to the time. I mean, that's, you know, you know. there'll be some. Well, no, if it's coming up, it has to be renewed. When the insurance is... Uh, let's say void because of non-payment. Is it incumbent upon the insurance carrier to notify the co-insured? I don't. That's an insurance question. I don't know. Who's the co-insured? Oh, I'm just the co-insured. Yeah. No, your unit, your homeowner's policy is not going to name your co-op or your condo as an additional insured. It's not going to happen. Would, would the, the mortgage holder be co-insured? Yeah, the, the, the mortgage uh, mortgage company could be a lost payee, and the recipient and the funds uh, against which they're collateral, the, the unit uh, serve. Okay. Oh, tell them about some But that doesn't necessarily help the building in any way. Well, maybe that's something that should be addressed. It's, the insurance industry a whole, as a whole likely will not address it any time. <laughs> okay, Michelle, you're up. Um, hello, Michelle, Imperial Owners Corp. Michelle Bart. Um, I think most of my questions have already been answered. It was basically about the wave of segregation and how that works. I was I wanted the attorneys and hoped that the attorneys would explain it to us because um, there's always an issue of <laughs> um, if, a, if a shareholder is negligent, of course they have their own co-op insurance which covers their own property, but how to deal with rent abatement 
uh, when it was clearly the shareholders' responsibility and negligence, and how far does that have to be taken? How, how does one prove that? And um, is that even possible with the waiver of separation, which seems to not say based on what we've just discussed? Do you want that in 10 words or less? Yeah, I was going to say. It's about three Possibly. words. Possibly. <laughs> Could we have the microphone? Absolutely. Here it comes. Here you go, Kim. Okay, Jason, you correct me. Okay, all right. The waiver of subrogation. Uh, it's it's basically if if you are um, if you're covered by insurance and uh, you suffer a loss. Let's say actually, let's use a real life example. Okay, you you your um, uh, your 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 radiator leaks and it leaks down. Okay, and it damages the uh, the ceiling of the of the con of the co-op. Okay, um, actually make it the condo. All right. And, and so the condo says, oh my God, we have fifteen that we have fifty thousand dollars worth of water damage. Uh, we, uh, we want to collect that. Well, the, the waiver of subrogation would say for each, each, if it's mutual, says each person has to look to his own insurance company and to, for reimbursement, so that the condo can only go to its own insurer and say, you reimburse me for that fifty thousand dollars worth of damage, and. The insurance company, and this is, the, this is what subrogation means, the insurance company usually or frequently steps into the shoes of the condo and says, okay, we just had to pay the condo $50,000, now let's, let's, get, let's, let's sue the guy whose uh, who's radiator broke because he didn't maintain it, you know, he was negligent. The waiver says they can't, okay? So, and conversely, if the condo uh, if a pipe inside the wall bursts, okay, and it damages property of the owner or the shareholder, then, and, the, and there's a waiver of subrogation clause, the shareholder has to look first to his insurance and then get reimbursed for the insurance. Now, the things it doesn't cover, okay, are the deductible and if the claim exceeds or if the shareholder isn't carrying insurance, all right? Then he has no insurance, then he has no insurance Against which he can waive, which sub, against which subrogation can be waived. So that's another reason to make sure that your 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 shareholders and your unit owners carry homeowners insurance. Okay. What would say. you suggest is the best policy for a building to have? Well, I, I think I'll, I'll use a play on your words. The best policy is for a building to have a requirement that everybody have insurance. Because if everybody, if all if all parties have insurance. The whole process is a lot smoother and easier on everybody. So that's. I've seen people. I've seen buildings pay two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars for damage that was negligence of a shareholder, Welcome and it was just too costly living. to to litigate it. But, but it was less costly. Community than living. It's, yeah. you sign, there's benefits and. Yeah. You know, and that happens every. I mean, if you're if you're the person who if you're the person who smoked in his bed and caused a million dollars worth of damage, I mean, you're going to be. Your life will be over. I mean, it, it's a. I, what I mean, though, is, is you know, it's going to bankrupt you. So this is a, this is a, a, a policy determination that people have made that we're not going to try to bankrupt people uh, over damage like this. Fair enough. Hey, Louise Shepard, you had a question. You know, Jason answered it. Okay. Jason answered the question. Who? Caesar Manfredi. Do you need the mic? No. Okay, we'll be right there. Caesar, did you have, did you have, okay, and then we'll get to that lady in the back. You know, you mentioned about needing the homeowner's insurance, which we do ask for and so forth, but what, what's the risk to the co-op if one doesn't have, if, if the shareholder doesn't, what's the risk to the co-op? If the co-op's negligent. No, no, if, if, if they, I don't know, got the water running and it spills over the sink and it runs downstairs and it's damaged to the kitchen and... And, and the sheetrock, which is co-op property, uh, what, what's the risk? If the guy doesn't have insurance, what money does the co-op incur that wouldn't be if he had insurance? It's like uninsured motorist insurance, right? If, if, the, if there's damage and the shareholder's carrying insurance, then if the co-op can, then then if there's if there's negligence, then the, the, the shareholder the co-op the shareholders insurance company might pay for some of it. Actually, look at it if there's a dispute between the shareholders. You know what I mean? 
I'm gonna ask you to answer. <laughs> I mean, just a real simple. I'll give you a great example. What's the risk to the car? I'll give you a great example of that. If a if a if a shareholder has a huge water loss, they were down in Florida and they forgot to the set their thermostat and the pipes burst, and there was water everywhere. The co-op's insurance could pay to repair, uh, repair the common areas. But if there is water and mold throughout that shareholder's unit, and the shareholder doesn't have the money and he wasn't insured properly, you're going to have mold pretty soon throughout the whole building. Okay. And everybody's value is going to decrease as a result unless that mold, and, they're going to, and the building's going to end up having to pay for it. So if the shareholder had insurance, the insurance company would address that. And, 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 Make sure not that money devalue the everybody's property or cost the cost. Oh, the guy's going to be out of work anyway. <laughs> Terminate. Take us apart. No. No, that's no, no, complicated. No. We, we, have a, we have a lady in the far side of the room. It's all yours. I'm Chris Haggerty from the Valentine Gardens Co-op. It's on the uh, Riverdale Bronx border. Actually, in Yonkers, but it sounds better to say you're in Riverdale. And we, we are dealing with the question of how many people is it okay to have living in an apartment? Let's say one person moves in, like a grandmother type, and all of a sudden her kid, with her kids, move in. Is there a limit to how many can live there? You know, it's, it seems to me that the, uh, one, the front person comes and gets approved, but then she brings all her relatives. And how is that uh, handled, or can it be handled? Okay, there, first of all, the number of people is an issue that's really uh, building codes. That, that's, you know, if you have 20 people in a one bedroom apartment, it's probably going to be a violation. So the number is, is you know, has a certain, certain parameters as far as what's legal. Um, with regard to who can live there under the co-op lease is what you're talking about. And generally speaking, it's spelled out. So a shareholder and their family, uh, uh, another parent could move in. Um, I don't think there's much you can do about that. Uh, depending on the numbers and the configuration of the relationships, it would be it would depend on the proprietor at least. Dorothy, does it have to do with the number of bedrooms? Bathrooms. It's bathrooms, but that's all the bathrooms. zoning. But that, but that's the zoning. I don't know. It's each municipality is zoning. It's I, had, a, yeah. I had looked into it for one of my buildings, yeah. and it's a sort of a ratio between number of bedrooms and square feet footage. Yeah. Uh, of those of, of the apartment, and right. uh, that just, it's a state regulation, but there's right. some combination of those two. A two-bedroom apartment with 500 square feet can have so many people. It's a lot of people. No <laughs> it turns out to be a lot of people. It's much more than you would think also. Uh, I think we have maybe time for one more question. Do we have uh, another question on the floor? You're talking about co-op and condos. You, you have to address the fact that a co-op is merely shares in a corporation. It is not a lease to own the apartment. You are merely a renter, just as, a, and, as, you, as though you had a landlord. You only own shares in a corporation. So many of the things you're saying here, you're comparing it to a condo, doesn't work. All right, so, so, uh, so, uh, so anybody wanna, wanna uh, that seemed to be a very definitive statement from Mona Scheinman. And uh, I think Mona has effectively wiped out the past 90 minutes of this program. Uh, so, um, I, I, heard, I heard Chief Counsel Ken Finger say it's a proprietor release. So uh, anyway, we're gonna let that ride. Uh, for our consideration tonight. Th Mona, this is the reason why I have nightmares. Uh, 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 ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of uh, Jeff Haley, who is returning, uh, he put together a terrific program with, the, with, uh, with Diana Burrell. And, and uh, thanks. A nice round of applause to our speakers and participants. Thank you very much. See you, see you at the next CCAC meeting, but see you for Richard Ravitch on November the 20th and at our holiday party on December 5th. Safe home. Thanks very much. Have a good evening.